But uh, this will be this message will come in two parts. You know, part one uh, today and part two because there's just too much to talk about. But the title of the message is the window. When we talk about the window in scriptures, different places that the window is mentioned in scriptures and some of the meanings behind it. One of the first windows we come to is in Genesis 6.16, where the Lord commanded Noah to make a window in the ark. A window in the ark. It doesn't say fill the ark full of windows or anything else. It make a window in the ark. Apparently, this window would be used for observance and looking out and looking at situations and what the, the calamities that, that were existing at the time. <coughs> In Genesis <coughs> excuse me, 8, 6, he opened up the window after the storm and the rain ceased and the ark is just floating in the wa water. He opened up a window and he sent forth a raven to spy out the land. Now, why a raven? Well, I don't know if you've ever seen. you ever seen ravens high in the air? Ravens can soar pretty high. They can catch a wind current, and they can be up there for a long time without wearing out. The raven can spy a lot of land in a short period of time. So sent the raven up. But the scripture says the raven came to and fro to the ark all the time. So the raven didn't see anything or any place to go. So he stayed up there going coming and going until one day the raven didn't come back. And then the Lord on Genesis 8.8 8, sent forth a dove. And it says that the, the dove took off. Now why a dove? What does the dove represent? The Holy Spirit. It also represents grace and peace. It's a clean bird that can be used for sacrifice. It's a humble bird. So the Lord sent out a dove, whereas the raven went out, and the raven, you know, he eats carrion, and he's looking for anything dead for him to eat on, or whatever, and, uh, but now the dove goes out as a symbol of peace, that peace has come over, come over the earth at this time. But the dove came back, and then it said that Noah reached out the window and brought the dove back into the ark, back into the ark. We need to also understand that we need to pull the Holy Spirit back into our lives, too. Sometimes the Holy Spirit goes out, but we've got to learn to pull it back into our lives when the time is appropriate. Seven days later, Noah sent the dove out again, and it came back with an olive leaf in its mouth, which is an indication peace of God. And seven days later, the dove was sent out again, but this time it did not return. Why seven days? Is it possible that Noah was sending the dove out on Shabbat? It could be. He sent it out initially on Shabbat, waited seven days, did it again, waited seven days, and did it again. We don't know, but it could be. There were seven day cycles there <coughs> when that was taking place. So the dove finally <coughs> came back with an olive leaf in its mouth. And we know that that indicates peace with God. And Noah knew then that things were well. The judgment was over. It was just a matter of time for the water to recede. So we learn in the first window in the Bible, we learn about it being on the Ark of the Covenant. I mean the Ark of, the, of Noah. But the Ark, we are also an Ark. I don't know if you know that or not. Every vessel in Moses' tabernacle should be present in our lives, including the ark. We are also an ark because we are the temple of God, and that's where God dwells. So we also should be sending out the Holy Spirit coming and going in our lives at all times. The second window I want to talk about is Joshua 2.15. Here, when Joshua sent two spies to Jericho, and they began to spy out the city of Jericho before they, before they conquered the city, and the two men end up dwelling in the house of Rahab the harlot. And Rahab had a, a, a house built part of the, on, on the edge of the wall, outside wall. And so as they were roaming around looking for a place to stay, 
they end up staying with Rahab the harlot. Now, don't ask me why. I don't know why they went to Rahab the harlot's house, but that's where they ended up going. But then the word got out to the king of Jericho that two Hebrew spies are now dwelling at Rahab the harlot's house. So they came to get these two Hebrew spies. And what does Rahab do? She lets them down by a rope through the window and tells them to go hide in the mountains for three days, in which they did. And so when the king and his forces went out looking for the two men, uh, they couldn't find them. And then the men went back to Joshua and told Joshua all that what had happened. But as the men were being left, let out the window of Rahab's house, Rahab called out to him and says, because I helped you, would you spare me and my household from destruction when your army comes? And so the two Hebrew men said, then in order to make sure that takes place, hang a scarlet thread out your window. So Rahab hung a scarlet thread as a signal out the window to let the Hebrews know when they come to deliver her. And as the scripture shows that when they came and the walls of Jericho fell that they, and they stormed the city, that those same two Hebrew spies ran to Rahab's house and there she had all her family there in her house and he delivered them all out at that time and none of them were hurt, her whole family. The amazing thing about that story is that Rahab, if you didn't know this, was like a great-great-grandmother to King David and Yeshua. So you hear you had a Jericho individual that was called a harlot that saved the two Hebrew men that they were looking for, and she ended up being blessed by God and ended up being part of the descendancy of King David and eventually Yeshua. So if God can reach out to a harlot and make her part of the family of God, what can he do to us? It's a wonderful thing. And she held out the scarlet thread, which is almost like the same thing as putting blood of the Passover lamb on the door. The judgment will pass over her house. The scarlet thread represents probably the blood of Yeshua. When he hung out the scarlet thread. There's been people that have actually written books about the scarlet thread. That's out there. So, God must have put in the heart of Rahab that these men needed to be protected, that she needed to understand their God and be delivered. And she not only understood, she became a believer in the Hebrew God and eventually written into history as a descendant of, or, or David would be a descendant of hers along with Yeshua at that time. So we have a window there with a scarlet thread. Now what are windows used for? Some people say, well, windows are used for observance. Windows sometimes can work in deliverance. Windows can work as an escape device. Windows can be used to observe if evil is coming and bad things are coming in people's lives. Windows are important. Spiritually speaking, what is a window to us today? Our eyes, our brains, our ears, our mouth are all windows. What we let in and out of these windows is very, very important in our life. A window can be a defensive measure. So we have to understand that windows, spiritual windows, are very important to us. In first. Samuel 19, King Saul was going to kill David. If you remember the story, King Saul went crazy, got filled with a demon, and he did not like David because David became very popular, and Saul got very jealous of David. And Saul had already given David his daughter's hand in marriage, uh, Michal, and uh, but, but Saul wanted David dead. So one day Saul sent men to David's house and said, kill David. We want to kill David. So when the word got to Michal and David that military guys were coming to kill him under orders of Saul, Michal 
let David out of her window. Lowered him down to the ground. And then made up a false body in bed and told the people that David was sick. And so the soldiers went back to Saul and Saul basically said, I don't care if he's sick, kill him. So they went back again and they pulled the blankets back and found out there was a dummy there. And so, so uh, Saul got after his daughter and said, what have you done? Why have you betrayed me? But Michal decided to support her husband instead of her father. And so she protected her husband, which is like what Genesis 2.24 says, that when you take a, a, a husband or a wife, the two become as one flesh. And then your desire should be to that spouse. That's where your desire should be once you are married to your spouse. So Michal made sure David was protected even against her father. But even then, Michal said something very interesting when Saul said, why did you deceive me? And, and Michal said, well, he was going to kill me if I didn't let him out. I said, that was a weird statement. You know, so here you are, d Lauren David out of the window to spare his life, and then you're telling your father, he, he's going to kill me. But she figured that she might, might have lost her life if she didn't say that, I'm sure. So she was trying to protect herself, too. So anyway, David fled to the house of Samuel the prophet. Saul pursued with his men. And they got to Samuel's house and they wanted David. And this, this was an amazing thing that took place. Because of Samuel being the prophet, he all of a sudden, I don't know if he raised his hands or he prayed or what he did, but the Holy Spirit fell upon the soldiers, and on Saul, and they all began to prophesy. So here was men wanting to kill David and do David in. And they come to the house of Samuel, said, give us David that we may kill him. And Samuel, and all of a sudden, they all started prophesying, and they couldn't stop. And David got away again. <laughs> An amazing, amazing thing to take place. That the Holy Spirit fell upon these men who wanted to kill the anointed of God, King, or soon to be King David, that they began to prophesy, and they couldn't stop themselves. I don't know about you, but I want that kind of spirit on me also, to be able to prophesy without ceasing and, and totally contrary to whatever my plans were, to begin to prophesy upon God. And that's what happened, and David managed to escape. But there we have another story of a window where Michal rescued David, gave David deliverance and protection by lowering him out of window. We seem to have a lot of lowering out of windows in the Bible. A lot of people seem to get lowered out of windows. And sometimes windows are used for observance, and sometimes we use windows to make judgments whether good or bad, or curses or blessings. But if our eyes, our mouth, and our ears are windows, and we are looking out those windows, how do we respond to what we see? Are we giving forth blessing, or are we giving forth curses? It's very important that we keep it in the blessing side. So another incident occurred in 2 Samuel 6, 16, that Michal, David's wife, was looking through the window and saw David dancing half naked with only a towel wrapped around him, leaping and dancing, bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David in Zion. And, she's, and the Bible says she despised him in her heart. So she brought forth a curse upon her because of that. And when David got there, Michal began to chew, her, chew him out and says, you are so undignified as a king doing these things. You should not have been doing those things. And David told her, therefore I will play before the Lord and I will be yet more despicable than this and will be humble in my own sight. So David was basically telling his wife, says, if it's for the Lord, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I want to do for the Lord. And the Lord will bless it. 
And I said, I'll be humble within myself. So in other words, he's saying that whatever, however you think how I'm supposed to be humble isn't the way it's going to be. It's how I think I am supposed to be humble before the Lord. He said, I'm going to be more despicable than this, so better get ready, lady. <laughs> is what basically he told his wife. That I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to jump up and down, and I'm going to praise. And you can see that through David's Psalms. Look at all the things that David wrote in his Psalms and how to praise God. The raising of the hands, the dance, the shout, the sounding of instruments. David was not going to allow anybody to restrain him in praising God. And as a result, Mikkel, a curse came upon Mikkel, and she was barren until death. So that poor lady never had a child because she despised David in her heart. We must be careful about making any kind of accus accusations against the anointed of God. It could come back to bite us. Very bad. So poor Mikkel, barren all the rest of her life. Some will look down from the windows of superiority and condemn those who love the Lord in an outward fashion. So we have to be careful. Just because they worship differently than us, it doesn't mean the blessings of the Lord is not upon them. 2 Kings 9.1 Now as we talk about this one, I want you to also consider and compare it to things that are happening today. But particularly in the political realm. Elijah, after he ran from Jezebel, was hiding at Horeb. And, and the Lord is telling Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah? He says, oh, they're after me. They want to kill me. You got to send us after Elijah had fire come down from heaven and burn up the sacrifices in front of the, the priest of Baal. So if anything, you thought you would think he would be fired up and the things of God want to do the things of God. And he was initially until he heard that Jezebel was coming after him to kill him. When he heard that, he turned and ran. Now Jezebel must have been quite a witchy woman. That's the only thing I can figure out. You just saw the miracle of this fire come down from heaven and you're pumped up and the people of Israel are pumped up to kill the priest of Baal and now you're taking off after Jezebel. And all of a sudden the word came that Jezebel's coming after you. Breaks her on, you go the other direction. Now Elijah fled to Mount Horeb, which is Sinai. Mount Sinai. A long ways. So not only did Elijah just run to a different area, he ran a couple hundred miles away to get away from this woman. What was it about this woman that scared him half to death? Something scared Elijah. So while he was in the cave at Horeb, and the Lord said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Oh, they're after me. They want to kill me. And, and uh, I'm the only one that's left. I, I like to call it the Elijah syndrome. I'm the only one that serves the Lord. I'm the only one. And the Lord real quickly got all over Elijah and says, you know, I got 5,000 have not bowed a knee to Baal, so get out of your pity party. You got work to do. And so the Lord told Elijah, I want you to go and find Jehu, and I want you to anoint him king over Israel. Now, Jehu, J-E-H-U, correctly in Hebrew, is Yehu. Has anybody ever heard, he's a real Yehu? <laughs> this is where they get this. This is Yehu. This is when people say, yeah, he was a real Yehu, and you're going to see, understand why here in a moment. But that, that term comes from this story, that from, from Yehu. So, unfortunately, uh, right after that, Elisha came on the scene, got the man of Elijah. Elijah was ascended into heaven. So apparently Elijah must have told Elisha, oh, by the way, I'm ascending to heaven. I don't have time, but you got to go and anoint Yehu to be king over northern Israel. So Elisha, who now picked up the mantle of Elijah, decided, okay, well, that's going to be one of my first acts to do. 
So he went across the Jordan or toward the Syria side where, where uh, Yehu was. And he sent a young prophet and said, all right, young prophet, I want you to go in there and I want you to pour oil over Yehu's head and I want you to anoint him to be king over Israel. Now, I don't know why Elisha didn't do it. He sent this young prophet to do it. But then Elisha tells him, and as soon as you, after you pour the oil over his head, run. Now, how would you like to have an order like that? You're going to go anoint this guy, and as soon as you pour the oil over him, run for your life. Oh, yeah, I want that job. But this is exactly what happened. Now, according to uh, uh, rabbinical commentaries, they believe that this young prophet was Jonah in the early, when he was younger. It was the prophet Jonah. And so the timing of this would have been right at the time Jonah would have been a prophet, is what they say. So they believe that this young prophet, Jonah, from the school of the prophets that Elijah and Elisha were running, was the one that went in the house and said that when he went to the, this house, it was full of the captains and commanders of King Ahab's army. And if you don't know who King Ahab is, he's a king in northern Israel, and his wife is Jezebel. So this young prophet went in there, and they, and they all, you know, these are tough guys, mean guys, rough guys. They're not, they're not politicians. They're not descendants from kings. They're just rough, tough guys and probably don't know how to act very well among people or whatever. And he came in the door, and they said, what do you want? Uh, I'm here to see uh, Yehu. Oh, that's him right there. So they said they took him back into an inner room, got him back in there, and he says, I am to anoint you king over Israel. So he poured oil over this Yehu's head, and he says, and you will kill the household of Ahab and his sons and Jezebel, and the body of Jezebel will be eaten by dogs. See you! <laughs> He's gone. So you could just see Yehu going, What? He just, I just got anointed king over Israel, and I'm going to kill the household of Ahab and kill Jezebel, and the dogs are going to eat her body? Huh. So what did Jehu do? Or Yehu do? <laughs> you would think that he'd ponder over and think about that for a while. Gee, I'm not sure about that. That's kind of weird. No, it says that he got in his chariot and drove furiously like a madman to the house of Ahab. So here was a man who had just been anointed by God to avenge the servants and prophets of God that Jezebel had killed. Do you recognize something about this in our political climate today? Is there another Yehu today that's in our White House today that is avenging the servants of God and the prophets of God? Yeah, there is. His name is Donald Trump. A man unskilled at political concepts. A man that may have been a little rough around the edges like the commander Yehu who may even said things harshly like Yehu did. But God's anointing fell upon him, and he came into the White House to try to restore the things of God back in this nation. So you see some similarities between Yehu and even Donald Trump today. So when, when Yehu drove fiercely to the house of Ahab, a Ahab was already dead. Ahab was killed earlier in an earlier battle, but his son Joram was ruling. And he saw Jehu riding fiercely, so Joram got in his chariot and went out there to, to meet Jehu because he thought maybe Jehu was bringing some news, terrible news or something. And then so he, Joram yelled out to Jehu, is this peace? And basically Jehu yelled back, there's no peace in this house. Oh, so Joram turned his chariot around, decided to get out of there. 
Jehu pulled back his bow and shot him between the shoulder blades and killed the current king of Israel, Joram. Then he rides on in to the Ahab's palace there in Samaria. And as he's riding in, he looks up to a window on the high walls of Samaria. And who's at that window but Jezebel? And Jezebel is looking out that window. And she's all duded up. She's got all kinds of makeup on. Her hair even says her hair was all fixed up. She, she was looking wonderful. And she's looking out the window down at Yehu. And that's, you know, I was talking about Yehu. You know, uh, he rode his chariot fiercely and just ran like crazy into the palace over top of everything. And that's when people say, he's a real Yehu. You know, he kind of does things he does that normal people don't do. This is what a Yehu is. This is Yehu. And so Yehu looks up and sees Jezebel looking out of the window. Is this peace, she says? And he says, there is no peace in this household. And then he, then he yells up, is there anybody up there who will throw her out the window? <laughs> and it says her eunuchs that were, that were her servants up there threw her out the window. And she splattered on the ground. And then it says he took his chariot and ran over. So not only did Jezebel come down and hit the ground and probably died even there, Yehu was going to make sure. <laughs> so he took his chariot and drove over her. Sometimes you just got to make sure the job is done. Why was Jezebel looking out the window all duded up? Maybe because she was going to use her charms and her wiles to try to convince Yehu not to hurt her. So we also got to be careful about things that we see in other windows. Other windows that may not be good for us. We got to discern. We got to look what's good looking out windows. It's very important that we do that. Somebody else's window. And Yehu said, throw her down and she was thrown down. And that's the way we should be. When somebody else is trying to convince us out looking out their window of doing things that are not right with God, we need to throw it down and stomp it so it has no influence in our lives at all. So the Jezebel that looks out the window and tries to charm us using her wiles to try to deceive us. We have to be very careful about that. Now Yehu did away with the altars of Baal, did a lot of good things for northern Israel but he wasn't solely righteous. But it did say that his household will continue for three generations. But then the king of Assyria came down and defeated Jehu's household because he didn't totally walk in the righteousness of God because it says he followed after Jeroboam with the golden calves. He did really good, but not holy. And that's why our, our lives, we need to be kodeshim, holy, in all that we do, we cannot be good about this and bad about that. It's got to be 100% with God. We've got to walk in righteousness 100% with God. And like I've talked about many times before, we say, well, I'm, going to, I'm just going to use the grace of God. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to sin and then ask for forgiveness. And then sin and ask for forgiveness. To sin and ask for forgiveness. That doesn't work, folks. It may work for a season, but what happens is your heart gets hard. And before too long, you won't be asking for forgiveness, at least not mean it anymore. You'll just use it as like a, 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 uh, a right to sin or a cause to sin, calling on the grace of God. And God knows the difference. We can't do that. We can't do that. We've got to walk 100% in the righteousness of God. Now, when I say that, we will make mistakes and we will fail. We can't keep that up. But 
with the heart, our heart is right, we we'll call out to God and ask for forgiveness. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But your heart has got to remain right and toward him at all times. So when you make a mistake, then his grace will truly fall down upon you when you ask for forgiveness. So even Jehu's family, or Jehu's family, there never can be peace with those who do evil. Throw evil out the window for utter destruction. So when they said the dogs will eat Jezebel, that's exactly what happened. The Jehu said, go bury the woman. So he sent men to go bury Jezebel and they come back and said <laughs> all we saw was a hand and a skull there's nothing left of her so just like the prophet Bobby Jonah said and the dogs will eat her and they did they ate her body And there was nothing left of her to even bury. So the scripture goes on to say that she was not buried. Because there was nothing to bury. There probably was a reason for that. So, no, so her followers can't go to her gravesite and visit her and even pray to her spirit or whatever that there was nowhere for them to go. The dogs consumed her. So after she was thrown out the window... And Yehu run her over with a chariot. Then the dogs came. That's the way we need to treat sin. Amen. Right? Amen. Throw it out the window. Stop it. And then for its utter destruction. And do not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Amen?